Would you open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians? The book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. Hallelujah. Look at chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. want to read three verses of scripture starting from verse number 10 reading from the King James Version it says I'll read it into your hearing then we'll read it together in unison that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he father God might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Thank you, Jesus. In whom, Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, the Father God, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory that we should be to the praise of his glory. Again, it says in verse number 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Would you say inheritance? inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. For a few minutes, we want to talk about the praise of his glory. The praise of his glory. Hug somebody. Tell them you got an inheritance, whether you know it or not. The praise of his glory. The praise of his glory. You may be seated, the praise of his glory. You know, we've been talking a lot about sin and what Jesus has done for us to deal with sin and what we have to do to be set free from sin. But today we want to talk about another aspect of sin from God's perspective. When we think about God and the awesomeness of God, we wonder why God cares about us. Why does he even care about mankind? We echo the words of Hebrews 2 where it says in Hebrews 2 and 6, what are people that you should think of them? Or a son of man that you should care for him. Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Wow. Why does God care so much? And we find the answer in Romans. God's eternal purpose according to the word is glory Amen. God's eternal purpose according to the word is glory it is his purpose in creation and it is his purpose in redemption did you hear me it's his purpose in creation and it's his purpose in redemption it says in Romans 3, 23 about the glory of God. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the glory of the children of God, Paul talks about in Romans 8. He says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So God cares about glory. Amen. Somebody say glory. glory. 
God's purpose for man was glory. His glory and their glory. To have sons and bring those sons into his glory. To glorify him and to be with him in glory. Sin interfered with that purpose. And it caused man to miss God's glory. Amen. When we read all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, our focus is on the sin, but God's focus is on the glory. Amen. See, the result of sin is that we forfeit God's glory. Help us today, Holy Spirit. God's glory is, is the focus that God had to bring us back to. So God had to redeem us. And the result, the result of redemption is that we are again qualified for glory. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. It says in Romans 8 chapter, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now listen now, verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him Catch this now, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Wait a minute, in us. Woo! With the glory that's going to be revealed. In us. Amen. We suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. Can you see here that God's objective is glory? It was that Jesus Christ, his son, would bring us back into his glory. Also in chapter 8 down to verse 29, Paul says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to his image, to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, get this now, moreover, I love this passage, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified but we always stop there but he goes on and say and whom he justified he also glorified when we think of sin we think of the judgment it will bring and we associate it with condemnation in hell we think of punishment that will come if we sin but God's thought is always of the glory that man will miss. Not the punishment he's going to get, the glory he will miss. God's purpose in our inheritance is our glory. Because sin by Adam interrupted that purpose. He then made Christ the firstborn so many could be glorified through him. <laughs> Amen. The divine purpose in creation and redemption was that God should have many children. He wanted us. Amen. And he could not be satisfied without us. Amen. In Luke, in Luke, Jesus shares three parables. We read these parables probably in your life over and over again, but he shares three parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And in reading the story of the prodigal son, most people are impressed with all of the trouble that the prodigal son goes through. Right? And we are occupied in thinking about what the son went through. 
He ended up in a pig's pen. Didn't he? He squandered all that he had. To the point he had nothing to eat. He was trying to eat what the hogs were eating. We get caught up with what the sun went through. But that is not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is the father. And what he says at the end. My son was lost and is found. <laughs> That's the heart of the story and the purpose of the parable. Wasn't about what the son went through. It's about what the father lost. Wasn't a question about what the son suffered, but of what the father loses. The father, he is the sufferer. He is the loser. So when the son comes back home, the father cries out, yes, my son has come home. <laughs> Look at the other two parables. In Luke 15, talks about the sheep. It says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness? And go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he is found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. <laughs> A sheep is lost, but who's is the lost? The shepherds. He said, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Was it about the sheep? It was about what the shepherd lost. Wasn't about what the sheep went through. But what the shepherd went through. We focus on the fact the sheep was lost, but the shepherd is the one that had the loss. We focus on what the son went through, but it was the father who went through. Mm. And again, the lost coin. It says in Luke 15 and 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. And loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, look what she does. She will call her friends <laughs> and call her neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. So, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God. There's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Wow. A coin is lost. Whose is the loss? It's the woman's. What did she say? Rejoice with me because I found my coin. See, that's the lesson of Luke chapter 15. Wasn't about the fact that there was a loss. There wasn't about the fact that the son strayed. It wasn't about the fact that the coin was lost. It was about the fact that the shepherd lost his sheep. The father lost his son. The woman lost her coin. And the focus was their loss, not who was lost, not what was lost. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me today. Amen. See, we are, <laughs> we are the lost sheep. We are the lost coin. We are the lost son. And God created us in his image to be his glorified sons on this earth. But sin interrupted and interfered. 
And Jesus had to come to redeem us. Why? Because God cares about what he lost. Amen. Hebrews 9 says, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. That's how much Jesus loves us. That he died to redeem us. To bring us back to God. To make us right with God again. That we could receive the glory we lost. <laughs> so that we could be in his glory. So we could be his glory. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, well, how did God accomplish this thing? Through his only begotten son, Jesus. Hebrews 2 says, God for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children, I love this, chose to bring many children into glory. You see the focus? He chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. So God chose Jesus to bring us back in the glory. Then First John comes and confirms it, says this in the third chapter. See how very much our father loves us? For he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him. For we will see him as he really is. Amen. Our inheritance is his glory, to have his glory, to be in his glory. And what then, Brother Jerry, what is glory? Well, glory is his life. Don't you realize that we have the same life today that God has in us? The life which he possesses in heaven is the life which he imparted to us here on earth. That's glory. Wow. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. So what God wants us to do is glorify him in these bodies. Let his life permeate. That's the glory. Oh, my goodness. Amen. We have this precious gift, y'all. It says in Romans 6, 23, but the way to the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It is for this reason that we can live a life of holiness. It's not our own life that has been changed. But the life of God has been imparted. He has imparted his life. He has imparted his glory. He has imparted his person. The glory of God has been imparted to you. (laughs) The glory of God has been given to you. Wow. That's why John says in 1 John 5, this is what God, this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son, whoever has the son has life. Mm. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. But if you have the Son, 
You have life. What life? Eternal life. What's that? Zoe. What's that? The life of God. Amen. So God is not only <laughs> creator, but he's also our father who longed for a family of sons and daughters. And when we, and when we receive the son of God, not only do we receive forgiveness of sins, that's so basic. God did, done so much more than just forgive you your sins. Not only do we get forgiveness of sins, not only do we get pardoned, not only do we get reconciled, but we also receive the divine life. That life that was represented in the garden by the tree of life. We received God. We received God. And when we receive God, we receive glory. Because God is glorious. Amen. So throughout your life, as you share the good news about Jesus, the aim in preaching is not to turn bad men into good men. We're not trying to turn bad men into good men. Because men, whether they're good or bad, can have no relationship with with God without Jesus. The only hope is that men will receive the Son of God. And when we do so, his life in us will constitute us as the sons of God. It's about receiving the Son. Because when you receive the Son, you have life. And when you have life, you have the glory of God. The brightness of his glory becomes part of you. <laughs> We've been qualified again when you receive Jesus to receive the life of God. But not just to deliver us from sin, but to receive an inheritance from God. Our inheritance, our inheritance. Can I say it? Is God himself. That's our inheritance. It's God himself. Become his son so we could experience him and his glory. That was the focus of Paul's prayer for the Ephesus believers. Remember he prayed. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. <laughs> we have an inheritance. In verse 11 of Ephesians 1, we have received an inheritance from God. Well, God, what's my inheritance? God says, it's me. <laughs> and to make sure we receive the inheritance God gave us, to make sure we receive it, he gave a guarantee. In Ephesians 1, 14, he said, the spirit is God's guarantee. <laughs> the spirit is God's guarantee. That he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He promised it. And he did this so we would praise and glorify him. I'll be through in a minute. To praise and glorify him. So, my brothers and sisters, God is seeking full-grown sons. But he does not stop even there. For he does not want his sons to live in a barn or a garage or a field. He wants them to be in his home. <laughs> he wants them to share in his glory. 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's, that's, the, that's the explanation of Romans 8 and 30. Whom he justified, them he glorified. It's sonship. Sonship, sonship. That's the full expression of sons. It's God's goal. It's for us to become sons. Fully grown sons. How can he do that? By justifying us and glorifying us. He set himself to have sons. And to have those sons mature and responsible with him in glory. He made provision for the whole of heaven to be peopled and glorified with glorified sons. <laughs> that was the purpose of God in redemption. So let me close with a couple of scriptures. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So the more we allow the life of God to manifest, it changes us into his glorious image. So that when people see us, they see glorified son. He's changing us into his glorious image. Changing us so that we can reflect his glory. See, we've been reflecting a whole lot of stuff in our lives, but he wants us to grow up and allow the Spirit to lead us so that he can cause us to be changed into his glorious image. And then we would reflect his glory. Then when people see you, they say, I see Jesus. I see the glory of the Lord. It's all on your face. I see the countenance of God over you. There's a cloud around you. Something happens when you come in the room. The light comes on in this place. The darkness moves out of the way. I love it when you come around. Because I see what I haven't seen before. <laughs> Okay. Reflecting the glory of God. Amen. And in that place of glory, when you're reflecting that glory, you don't walk in rooms gossiping. Because <laughs> that's not the glory. You don't walk in a room backbiting. You don't walk in a room condemning. Because God so loved the world. You walk in a room reflecting his glory and the hopeless begin to feel some hope and those who are condemning themselves begin to feel maybe God does love me because you're reflecting the glory of God To the praise of his glory. Thank you, Jesus. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 6, we praise the glory of his grace that's made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have forgiveness of sins and redemption through his blood. Can I say a couple of more things real quick? See, when we're allowing the glory of God, the life of God to manifest in us, then we can agree with what it says in 1 Corinthians. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You hear that? 
that in glory in the Lord. When, when we really embrace this glory, then we recognize what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 1, 29, when he said, no, no flesh can glory in his presence. See, when the glory of God is manifesting, I don't see your flesh. You may think it was glory, but it was flesh. Amen? Amen. Then whatever you do, then you would do to the glory of God. Because it's glory manifesting. It's glory you're reflecting. And what we see is his glory. Would you say with me to the praise of his glory? I am a glorified son. Would you stand to your feet? Well, give the Lord a hand clap for that. Hallelujah.